Who was the Beast 666? Half a century after his death, a whiff of sulfur and brimstone still clings to the name of Alistair Crowley. In the 20s, the Beaverbrook newspapers christened him the wickedest man in the world. By the 60s, he was a flower power hero, credited with the philosophy of doing one's own thing and appearing in the Beatles pantheon of people we like on the cover of Sgt. Pepper between Mae West and an oriental guru. I do not wish to paint Crowley as either saint or Satan, but I do think he qualifies as one of this century's good ideas, as an innovator, a religious synthesizer who required that we think for ourselves. Satanism is the worship of Satan, or Shaitan, the Hebrew word for adversary. This muddled accusation, levied on the shade of the notorious drug fiend, occultist and author, has not gone away yet. The beast's insouciance and sexual panache was starred on Lord Byron, though the later poet had to invent any titles he wanted. And invent, he did. A whole pseudo-aristocratic wardrobe, Baron Sparrow, the Laird of Beleskin, the Comte de Belstray, the Ipsissimus, Magical Grade, the very thing itself. The Beast died in a boarding house in Hastings in 1947. The Hymn to Pan, a fine poem by Crowley, was read at his funeral. Born in 1875, Crowley was brought up amidst religious dread and Victorian morals, which he reacted against with all the force of his considerable personality. Queen Victoria, A.C. wrote, was sheer suffocation, a vast thick fog that enveloped us all. We could not breathe, we could not see, the spirit of her age had killed everything we cared for. And it was against that spirit that the shaven-headed enfant terrible of Leamington took his strongest and most modern actions. When young, Crowley belonged briefly to the magical society, the Order of the Golden Dawn, along with W.B. Yeats. But unable to brook chastity or competition for long, the bully boy of British magic appeared in the inner sanctum, dressed in a kilt, playing the bagpipe. Crowley was duly expelled from the order, pinched a number of rituals, and started his own. Crowley, a bisexual, liked sex and drugs, lots of drugs. Ether, alcohol, and hanolium luini, opium, and its derivatives, cocaine and heroin. The speed with which Crowley's successive wives and consorts fell into degeneracy and alcohol was remarkable, as the beast, codenamed Crata Perdurabo, I will endure, trudged on in his self-appointed mission to save the world. Certainly Crowley preyed on the weak. To trample his loved ones into the primordial slime became a sort of Nietzschean imperative for Crowley. Indulgence in coke and heroin played their part as ever in this kind of destructive, egotistical behavior. Opiates were freely available over the counter for the first 50 years of the beast's life. Aspiring junkies, take note of the connection between loss of libido and drug abuse in his intensely self-scrutinizing diaries, chastening thought, hardly diabolic. The beast, like messiahs everywhere, went all the way and blurred the line between self and others. But we don't have to go all the way with AC to recognize the value of the areas he explored in the unconscious. If Crowley was not a Satanist, and not a saint, then what was he? There is his unusual claim to have founded a religion, something very un-English. Gerald York was a sometime disciple, and told me he thought Crowley, whom he called Old Crow, was a failed maker. Gerald had a talisman made from dried semen and menstrual blood on paper, created along Crowleyan lines, and he had consecrated this talisman with the aim of magically drawing together all of Crowley's manuscripts. The operation, he said, had been successful. In the early days, Crowley had a private income. In later years, when he lived off his disciples, he does not appear to have abated his roaring persona, testing the limits of social behavior by biting unlucky women on the back of the hand to draw blood, Mr. Crowley's unforgettable serpent kiss, sometimes by cooking inedibly hot curries. Oh, then Mr. Crowley has done it again, or slyly defecating on the rugs of his hostesses to tell them what exactly are you trying to say, 666? But 
went up against the nuclear merchants and other genocide enthusiasts of the 20th century, gross social behavior seems a quibble. And does not the master Gurdjieff say, always astonish? Gurdjieff, who bought and sold carpet to keep his hiring going, couldn't stand AC, and on their one meeting, the Turkish sage told him, get out, you dirty inside. As a rule, makers do not get on. Perhaps Gurdjieff had heard about Alistair's trick with the rug. Crowley, on his drive to save the world, had taken up an oriental tantric process, concentrating the will during the moment of orgasm. In Tantra, it is called the left-hand way. Crowley called it sex magic. The wish, according to devotees, will get you what you need, not everything you ask for. There is a school of thought that suggests he was the first sex instructor of the 20th century. If he occupies this position, it is by default. As sex explorer is closer to the mark, supping on the juices of himself and his companion of choice for their rejuvenative powers. He was in his 70s, plagued with asthma when he died, so it is not clear whether Dr. Crowley's special formula worked or not. W.B. Yeats and the Duke of Windsor went in for the rejuvenating effect of monkey glands. Takes all sorts. Another of the charges leveled against Crowley is that he was once a German spy. It is true that he wrote for the German newspapers when he lived in New York during the First World War. He'd run out of money living in Manhattan. The beast, tongue as ever in his own cheek when it wasn't investigating someone else's, wrote deliberately wild propaganda for a pro-German magazine, even giving his aunt's suburban address out as a target for the bombing. If his aunt forgave him, we should. More than anything, Crowley was a victim of the rise of the popular newspaper. In the 1920s, when Crowley was living in Sicily, D.H. Lawrence, that other monster, was living over the other side of Etna from Old Crow. Lawrence, of course, had run off with the cousin of a German fight race. Like Crowley, he was not only sexually obsessed, but downright unpatriotic. They could have met, they didn't. But history can be rewritten in the movie. A walk-on part for Lawrence, boxy and hard suit peering out at his shaven-headed rival from a post office queue in Chefalu, watching the swirl of Crowley's purple cape as he strides past like a cod Roman emperor in the sun. Three snapshots of things which actually happened at that same time. Old Crow doing coke, writing pot boilers 5,000 words a day to keep his commune afloat. D.H. Lawrence's book, the subsequent staple of spotty teenagers, are being burnt by the public hangman. And Lawrence's nude self-portraits, the front line challenging Victorian values, are being seized from a London gallery. Today, Lawrence has long been rehabilitated as a voice of sanity in spite of his frequent silliness. But old Crow, diabolical druggy, is still to return from outer darkness in the place of wailing and gnashing of tabloid molars. It was not, in fact, Beaverbrook and the British gutter press that finally destroyed the logos of the Eon's uneasy love nest. Benito Mussolini would brook no opposition and banned secret societies in Italy. Old Crow, who in his time had joined more Masonic lodges than he had trouser legs to roll, was given a week to leave. One of Crowley's guests, a brilliant mathematician, who had been in Crowley's thrall, had earlier died from enteritis. Crowley naturally was blamed in the papers for the death of a disciple and returned to England a public scoundrel, a position he deliberately misunderstood for fame. Crowleyanity's catchphrase was, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, a parody of St. Augustine's love and do what thou wilt. In 1904, Crowley had dictated to his wife a tract entitled The Book of the Law, which he subsequently came to believe was going to replace the Bible. Augustine was from Numibia and repented his excesses. Crowley was from Leamington in Warwickshire and like Edith Piaf, regretted very little. There's wickedness for you. So, is AC a good thing? Astrology and the I Ching are just two of the Eastern esoterica, unheard of or unusual at the time, that he championed, and that are now in our commonwealth of knowledge. A self-consciously false messiah in the modern mode he demanded, amidst the self-mockery, that we think for ourselves. More of the beast's purple prose is in print and on the lips of the young now than ever before. He would have said, I told you so. However, 
It is Crowley's rival, the poet Yeats, whose verbal magic was soaked in Golden Dawn symbolism, who should have the last word. Yeats wrote, Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with a lion body and head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs, while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. And what rough beast, it's our come round at last, slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. Penned in 1921, the lines had been taken as foreshadowing the West's collapse into fascism. They could also describe the beast, trying to live up to the impossible absolute of the bleak poetic marvel that was his vision and inspiration, as well as Yeats's. Life, not Satan, let Crowley down. Yeats is right, though. Today, love him or loathe him, the beast's hour is coming round at last. Drugs, sexual excess, anarchy and egotism. A true mirror for our time. The 1993 Oxford Dictionary of Quotation has finally embraced his catchphrase, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, and a movie of the beast is overdue. Love is the law, love under will. for Without Walls for a while, the armadillo goes back in the box until the autumn, when we'll be returning for a new season.